Now's the time to take advantage of it, by the way. Right now, the exemption per person is $12.3 million. And if you're married, what is that? That's $24.6 million that you can give away to anybody on the planet, not just people in your family, for without a tax event to you or the person receiving it. Tax planning for estate purposes is really important. And a lot of people don't realize how quickly they become wealthy. You know, you buy a house and then you close your eyes and open them and 15 years passes, suddenly your house is worth millions of dollars, right? A lot of people have that event. Your businesses become uh, worth a lot of money. So it, it, it happens quickly. And I think the people who do the planning are the ones who have the families that are be able to preserve the most wealth for the most amount of time. Welcome to the Paid to Create podcast, where we dig into the secret strategies of successful creators making a lucrative living. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I just have to tell you about Katra, the marketing platform that has seriously transformed my business. You know how running a business can be insanely time consuming, right? Well, Katra has been a game changer for me. It's honestly like having an entire marketing team in my pocket. And what I love most is that it automates all the tedious daily tasks for me, from marketing to sales to even customer experience. I can't believe how much time and energy I've saved since I started using it. And get this. With Kartra, I can create websites, funnels, courses, membership sites, email campaigns, calendars, surveys, you name it. It's made managing my business so much simpler and more affordable. Honestly, I can't recommend Kartra enough. If you're curious, head to paidcreatepodcast.com backslash Kartra to start your trial. Trust me, you won't regret it. So Grant, <laughs> welcome to our podcast, our yep. Paid to Create podcast. Um, we've invited you here today because you're our corporate law firm, but also, you know, I know each other very well and I've seen some of the things that you've done for other companies, um, not mine, but you'll probably do for mine eventually. Um, what does your firm specialize in? Not just for me, but for everybody. Sure. Thanks. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. So my firm is Teeple Hall LLP. We're a San Diego based law firm and we are a business firm. That means no divorce, no bankruptcy, no criminal right? No personal injury. All the stuff that businesses need and, and business owners and entrepreneurs need from their personal structuring, their estate planning that owns their businesses all the way through the operational side, the corporate governance of the companies. And then hopefully the American dream arrives and the sale of the company, or in some cases, the purchase of a company, depending on what side you're on. So we assist in all that. The firm is very heavily tax-based because usually the transactions that we that are uh, involved have lots of zeros behind them and a little bit of uh, 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 proper structuring for a tax purposes can make you a lot of money in the end, both on your personal side and the business side. So our clients tend to be high net worth individuals and mid-sized businesses up to about 500 million in sales. And uh, if they get much bigger than that, then they're probably a public company and they're a little big for our our shop. Karcher makes a little bit more than half yeah. a million every year. Um, but man, I have used you for a long time and the, the the tax stuff sounds sounds very boring, but I will I will tell everybody that it saved me millions. And uh, the process was was absolutely easy with with your firm. But so would you say that, that is, it, is it tax stuff or is it other stuff for your company like the mergers or selling? What's your favorite thing to do? You know, I think my favorite thing to do is selling a company because or, or helping someone buy a company because we're creating something new. At the end of the process, you've either got a pile of money or you've bought a company and you have a brand new adventure. So we're building stuff and it, it's really great to build stuff and, and enjoy with your client their success and watch them uh, you know, either spend lots of money on, on yachts and race cars or whatever they do when they sell their company or whatever it may be, uh, or buy something and, and uh, have a great new challenge. And, and you know, usually don't buy a company just to sit there. Someone's going to do something with it. They're going to improve it or they're going to uh, uh, you merge it with our current company. And so that's a really fun process to watch. I don't know that many entrepreneurs get into businesses thinking they're going to sell or buy other businesses. I think that's a thing that you get into later down the road. But when you do get there, it's it's so cool, man. We don't have to talk about my fancy car or anything because it's, <laughs> it's very fun for me to, to drive and beat you in. But <laughs> the things that you've helped me with, um, I went through sort of the uh, the tax strategies for for myself and my family. And um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So <clears throat> when you're there's two there's two places we really watch about structuring. One is your personal structuring. We watch out for the estate tax. Now, so what's the estate tax? That means there's a number and it used to be two million, then it was five million, 
Then it was 12 million, and Mr. Biden wants to bring it back down to 2 million if he can. And what is that number? That number is what we call an exemption. And that means everything that's in your estate over whatever the exemption number is, is taxed at guess how much? Every dollar in your estate above the exemption. You want to uh, guess? Uh, 50%. So, Madge, so will you really. Federally or California? Federally. Yeah. Federally, you're going to be at 50% tax, and California doesn't really have an estate tax for that purpose, but that is a big deal. So what we try to do is help people who have more than the exemption amounts. We really try to help them structure their estate in a way so that in the unfortunate event of death, which is going to happen to us all, we leave the planet at some day, right? In that event, what happens is, is that we want to make sure there's as little in your estate as possible. And there's lots of ways to do that. There's dynasty trusts, there's flips, family limited partnerships. There's all kinds of, there's gifting during the lifetime. There's all kinds of strategies. And they really, really make a lot of difference because nobody likes giving half of every dollar away to the government. And uh, when that exemption comes tumbling down again, uh, you're going to wish it had. Now's the time to take advantage of it, by the way. Right now, the exemption per person is $12.3 million. And if you're married, what is that? That's $24.6 million that you can give away to anybody on the planet, not just people in your family, for without a tax event to you or the person receiving it. But if you've got more than, if it goes back down to $2 million, and every dollar after $2 million, you give half to the government, it really it really creates a uh, big incentive for you to structure yourself personally. So that estate planning, uh, that for excuse me, that tax planning for estate purposes is really important. And a lot of people don't realize how quickly they become wealthy. You know, you buy a house and then you close your eyes and open them and 15 years passes, suddenly your house is worth millions of dollars, right? A lot of people have that event. Your businesses become uh, worth a lot of money. So uh, people get above the, some people think, oh, I'm never going to have $12 million or two or even $3 million, but you'd be surprised, right? The average median price for a home here in San Diego is well over almost a million dollars now. So it, it, it happens quickly. And I think the people who do the planning are the ones who have the families that are be able to preserve the most wealth for the most amount of time. Well, on that lovingly upbeat note about everybody dies, um, you actually <laughs> hit some positive points, which was talking about the savings that you're going to give to your kids. So nobody wants to think about dying, but you're right. Everyone does. And I will say, unfortunately for me, I did lose my husband. He passed away, but we hired uh, Teeple Hall back in the day and said, Hey, we are looking at this life event. It's not going to go well, but we want to make sure all of our paper is in order and all of our ducks in a row, because what can we do to minimize the damage to the family? Besides emotional burdens, obviously. Right. Um, so you walked us through that per um you walked us through that process really well and very cleanly. Um, it 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 saved me millions. And I will go, and I've talked on stage before, get your stuff together. Yep. Um, get your stuff together before you want to. Andy would always talk to me before about, hey, we need to talk about our wills. We need to talk about, and I, was like, I don't want to talk about that. That's terrible. I don't want that conversation. <laughs> and But now I'm so, so very grateful that we did. I'm grateful that you came to the house, had to sign papers, looked at everything, walked us through every part of it um, because it was so incredibly important <clears throat> for the the savings that we can now pass on to our children. Yeah, And you know, in addition to the savings, a, a great reason to do estate planning is the process people die and sometimes they die when you don't expect them to or people get sick and the last thing you want to do is be spending time messing around with lawyers so uh it's great when you depends on the lawyer <laughs> well, it depends on who it is right but if you're proactive in that way because one of the especially it's men we tend to die eight years be before the women's and so what happens is is we end up usually having to deal with an aggrieved widow most of the time and they have their children. They have a lot going on. And the last thing they want to do is be is is be messing with the legal logistics. If you've got just even a simple trust in place, forget the tax savings and things we just talked about. It makes the disposition of your estate, meaning how we administer it. We can do that in my office or, or any lawyer can do it in their office if it's a trust. If you have a will, you end up in probate court. And that takes longer. And that's a, that's a very arduous. And uh, I, I, I tell you the emotional side of having yourself organized when when you're having a when someone passes, it's a big deal emotionally, as you know. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. I and still so deal with it years it, later. <laughs> it, it, anything you can do to make that easier, I think, is worth its weight in gold and not just the savings, uh, tax savings, but just the emotional savings of having a smooth transition. The, the talks aren't fun in the beginning, but they, they certainly pay off in the end. I went to the bank and I was trying to get all of our 
bank ownership documents in order so I wouldn't have to go in after the fact and try to explain what had just happened because I don't want to talk about it. I was like, I don't want to deal with any of these dramas <clears throat> after the fact. I want to deal with my family. So we ended up taking all of the time with you in your office to deal with all the trust stuff so I didn't have to have those conversations. That was the thing I feared the most. Yeah. And people that don't expect their spouse to die, which, like you said, everyone does, um, but if someone dies suddenly or whatever, now you have to deal with all that stuff and you have to right. go to... You have to go to banks. You have to go to um, stocks, IRAs, like anything, social security, and ask for money for your kids. And that feels just really incredibly uncomfortable. Um, it's such a bummer when you're already in a very low mood. But um, what you did do for me and um, my company that is is doing really well was you saved us all of that headache so I could dive back into the company as the CEO and owner as soon as possible, which wasn't very long. Um, I probably should have taken longer, but uh, it's it's gone really well. And I've really enjoyed having that company structure that you've already put in place. So I'm going to pivot. Um, when somebody is just starting out, which a lot of people are just starting out, people go to LegalZoom, which uh, that's not <laughs> the best for right away. But is there a correct way you think that somebody would structure their business just starting out? Yes. Now, that's a great question. A lot of people come in and they hear me speak or they read a book or they go on the Google and they read about all these great structures. And I'm telling you, the you can have the most elaborate structures in the world. But if you don't have a profitable business in the first place, what's the point of having a complex structure? I like to counsel people when they're starting new businesses, when they don't have a lot of value, when they are the startup business, to keep it simple, stupid, hmm. right? Just as I always want you to have some kind of... Uh, Special purpose vehicle. What does that mean? If it's a it's a term of art that just really means some kind of entity, either a corporation or an LLC. Corporations, by the way, FYI, are becoming fairly disfavored in the business world. Almost everything is an LLC of some form or another. Why? <clears throat> the uh, LLC has a lot of flexibilities that corporations simply don't allow. Corporations have rules about who can own them and when. Corporations have certain other uh, limiting factors. Uh, LLC is... They used to be, when they first came along, people didn't even really think that they were going to uh, survive. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now they're the number one most formed business entity because of the flexibility they're recognized in every jurisdiction now in the United States. They provide the exact same amount of asset protection that a corporation would. And again, the flexibility in ownership and the other different rules have made it really so that almost nobody is really incorporating anymore. Well, so when you're talking about well, so all of my companies are LLCs because I, I listen to you. And uh, oh, most of the time. And so when somebody does that, they have a business, they've got their LLC now. Um, is there anything they should think about with their operating agreement, understanding that they're building a business to make money? And most people don't go in thinking they're going to end up selling their business. But a lot of them, if they've had a profitable business, do end up having the conversation, should I sell? Right. So if you are the only owner of the LLC or the only person, it really kind of doesn't matter what your operating agreement says because it's just you and you can change your mind. Correct. But most people have partners or investors or people who want some form of equity in the business. And so in that point, the LLC is the, the operating agreement. And so if you have LLC, we have operating agreements and corporations, we have shareholders agreements and they're the same damn thing with different names, right? It's the rules of how the company operates, how it's governed. And the, um, Important things that I always watch for in any operating agreement or shareholders agreement are voting. Voting is very important, right? Huh? You may not be the majority owner of your company, but you might want to have the ability to run the company, outvote everyone. So like uh, Warren Buffett and some of his co companies, he'll have uh, corporations or LLCs and he'll have different classes of stock, right? A, B, C, and D. And he may only own 10% of the company, but that may be the class A shares. But guess what? The class A shares, each share gets 10,000 votes. And the class C sh shares get one vote, right? So you can own 10% of the company and still have the majority of the ability to vote. And where is how does that happen? That's in the operating agreement. That's where that's defined. So voting is very important. I think especially if you're a minority owner, a lot of people <clears throat> get in business <clears throat> and have a minority position. They don't own all the company. And I think drafting into the operating agreement or the shareholder agreement exit strategies for minority holders is helpful. You know, after a certain amount of time, I can force you, it's called a put, to buy me out at a pre-agreed formula or a pre-agreed amount. That's great because otherwise, if you're a minority owner, you're captured, you're captive in that company until the majority decides they want to sell, right? So voting's important. 
Exit strategies are vitally important in the operating agreement. And then um, I think that the other thing that that is important and 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 I think goes unappreciated is uh, making sure that you have a seat at the board. If you're in a company, you want to be ideally able to have a be part of the conversation of what's happening with the company, where's it going. So if I'm a minority owner, aside from the ability to maybe get out things we just talked about, I'm going to want a seat at the board if I can, even if it's just to go and listen and be a fly on the wall. And more likely, since I never, I always like to talk and hear myself talk, more likely I want to participate in the dialogue with the company and, and help chart its future, which is going to be my future. So those are three big things that I look for in operating agreements always. Uh, if you sign an operating agreement with no way out, no ability to vote, and you can't sit at the board, then you're just an employee with it. You're at the, at the whims of, and what happens too? a very salient example that just happened about two months ago is that guy was 37 years old, had a lousy operating agreement, right? And he, uh, went and dro drove his, uh, brand new Porsche into a wall. And suddenly the people in the company are in business now with this gentleman's wife which isn't a problem, but that's not what they signed up for. And she doesn't have, <laughs> it's not a problem, but you, you, when you make a, when you get a partner or you're in a partnership or you're in a corporation and we, we all own a company together, we've made our deal together. And suddenly you take someone out of one of those chairs and you plop somebody and you've never even met before. You don't even have a background before. You know, this is why it's important to, to be forward thinking and take care of all the potential uh, permutations of what might happen in the company because it may or may not be a, a this person may or may not be a rock star right they may or may not have the the background that the that the uh, that the spouse had and it can be it can create a lot of tension and and problem in companies. Oh, typically when I partner with somebody, I'm I have no idea what their wife's skills are, so I have no idea or their husband's skills are. Like right. I wouldn't even know how to ask that, and that did happen to me too. We had where. Uh, Andy was understanding that he was protecting me and protecting our kids, making sure there's a buyout agreement if he is not here. Mm -hmm. um, but then when he got ill and I started running the company in his place, I was like, I don't want to be bought out anymore. Like this is our company. We grew together. It's our baby. Right. And now that I'm effectively running it and I love it, and I love our employees. I love our product. I love our customers. I don't want to be bought out and I don't want to have to be bought out. I want to change the operating agreement. So right. we did your office helped with that too. And that helped protect me and my wishes as a spouse. And then my, he went to his partner Hector and said, Hey, we're, we're going to bring Sarah in at a different level. You're not going to buy her out if I'm not here. And he agreed. So we had conditions and terms and all that. So we had all of the correct structure in place. Yep. Now you've got the correct structure. You've got your profitable company. We're going to assume everyone's doing very well. By the way, if uh, somebody decided that their operating agreement didn't allow them to vote, didn't allow them, they said they're basically an employee, they need to get a new law firm or they need to hire a law firm <laughs> immediately. Yeah. Like, I even told my brother and his company, I was like, have you, have you talked to your partners? Those five guys, all equal partners. Have you talked to your partners about what happens if one of them, you know, passes away, unfortunately? Exactly. So then do you want to be partners with that person's spouse? Do you want to have that person have a seat at your table? Do you want them to have voting rights? What are you guys going to agree as a company? And they're like, oh, shoot, we never thought of that. I was like, well, right. you would never think of that, except yeah. that you told me to think about it. And then I had to walk through that process. Yeah. Um, Very few people are lucky enough to have your situation where you were already working in the business and knew the business and were part of the fabric of the business. But typically, that's not the case. Sometimes the spouse <laughs> is a in a wholly unrelated industry, they're a school teacher or a police officer or a mail person or whatever. Most and now of the time. they're most of the time, and now they're thrust into the position of trying to make high end decisions that they've never made before. And so it's uh, it's something definitely you want to think about, and you definitely want to contemplate it when you're doing your operating agreement. You can't say thrust on a podcast. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so when someone goes with their company, let's say we've, we've all been profitable, we've been amazing, all of our operating agreements are correct. You've got your LLCs. Um, at what point when somebody wants to sell their company? Like what would be going through their head? Why would they choose to sell? Sure. Well, obviously one answer is the money, right? But uh, I said, but, don't say the money. <laughs> well, but you know, but, but, in, but the reality is that isn't what, what forces many of the sales. A lot of times there's life changes. They've gotten old, they've gotten burned out. They have a health condition. The, the economy's changed. The technologies have changed. They don't feel relevant anymore. Um, there's, there's so many reasons where, Someone decides, I, even though I don't want to sell, it's a smart thing for me to do. 
and those external factors like that are are a lot of the things. Um, there are, I, I should have looked this statistic up before I came, but I, I I didn't. But there are, I think it's a third of the businesses in the country are for sale at any one time in a two or three year period. And it's not just because someone's chasing the dollar. A lot of times it is because of those other events that we just talked about that drive it. I mean, you know what a huge reason to sell a company is? One of the number one beyond the profit motive is? Stress. Divorce. Ooh. Yikes. Divorce. Because now, how, how, <laughs> what are we going to do here? Who's going to, we've got this company. <clears throat> we own half of it. We have other partners who own the other half. We're getting divorced. Someone's going to have to buy somebody out. Nobody can write that big of a check. So what are you going to do? You sell the company. And that, that's like, that. Like your house. It's your asset. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. My best friend were talking. She had this house that she, she saw come on the market. Totally unrelated to business, but it makes sense to me that you said that. And uh, she said, I found this house. It's a really great, great deal. And she goes, and we've just been looking at this one area for, for years and years and years. And she goes, but finally, like, someone died and this is going to be awesome. And I was like, she's like, I mean, <laughs> I really want the house. It's great. I was like, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Death and divorce are huge reasons companies are sold. Death, destitution, and divorce. That's right. Death, All the positives. I hate to say it, but it's death, <laughs> drugs, and divorce. It's the triple D. Those three things account for more for sales than people realize. You know, <laughs> and that's every day, all the time. Hugs, not drugs. And that's really why just up on the, you asked about the sell side, but on the buy side, that's really where the opportunities are. Because every night the world spins and somebody falls off it, right? And, and there's a lot of opportunities to grow through acquisition. You know, a lot of people kill themselves to grow their business two, three, four, five percent a year. Well, sometimes if you do a strategic a acquisition, you can double or triple your footprint, your profitability, the volume, or maybe you're buying, let's say you're a car manufacturer and you buy a tire company, right? And so you're buying something in your supply chain. You know, all there's lots of reasons to do acquisitions to uh, make your company more profitable. And those those deals are out there all the time and it's a great way to grow. So that's a motivation for the buyer and certainly the motivation for the seller other than death drugs and uh, and divorce is sometimes just, they're just done. Right. Um, so I don't want to breeze over it, but what, uh, just so no, anyone that doesn't understand, what is an acquisition? An acquisition means, right, we're going to buy something. Just like when you go in the store and buy a gallon of milk. It's you've not as simple. Milk. <laughs> you acquired milk, right? So cost you some money. Yeah. You've acquired the milk. And, okay. and if lawyers, we use lots of fancy uh, words for buying and sell a company. We call them acquisitions. We call them liquidity events, right? There's lots of things like that. But at the end of the day, you're just selling something. Wow. That's why I asked to make sure that nobody's slipping through the cracks. I certainly had to be educated myself. Um, and so I have a question in front of me. It says, who's the seller in an M&H in Jackson? What does that mean? Well, the seller is usually the person who owns either the shares of the company, if it's a corporation or the membership units, if it's an LLC, or the seller many times is a company that has assets. A lot of times when people do purchases, they don't want your company. They just want the assets of your company. Now, why would that be? Why would someone not want to buy the company versus its assets? Well, I'm asking myself the question. The answer is because of liabilities, right? If I buy your company and it turns out four months ago, you were not giving your employees proper break times, or let's say some manager and an employee were having a relationship that was sexual harassment or something. When that lawsuit comes- Never happens. Never happens. And no one has sex anymore. No. When that happens, the company gets sued every time, right? But so if I, instead of buying your company, if I just buy all of the assets, I mean, I can buy your phone number. I can buy your trade name. I can buy your client trademark. List. I can buy your client list. I can buy, I don't need your corporate shell. I don't need your LLC shell. All that's going to get me is sued. So if I, if I leave you with the shell and I buy the assets out, then when that lawsuit comes, they don't sue the assets, right? They sue the company and you've got the company. It was your company. You can deal with it. Unless and, you have decent lawyer process and you have no liabilities yeah. as I have no yeah. liabilities. So there's a, there's a bias. This is a little <laughs> going down the hole here, but there's a bias for buyers to buy assets because they get away from those liabilities that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Plus those assets, you can depreciate them, right? Which is a thing that we do in taxes so that we can pay less taxes. We can depreciate those assets, but if I buy your shares of your corporation, not only do I have the liabilities now because I have the corporation, but you can't depreciate shares and stock. On the other side, 
on the seller side, so on the buyer side, well, I want to buy assets for those reasons. On the seller side, you want to sell your stock versus sell the assets. Now, why is that? I'll tell you. Because I can tell you're just, you're gripping to know the difference. No, oh, I just I'm like, where were you when I had to sell some <laughs> shares back in the day before you? And I was like, crap. <laughs> so the reason sellers want to sell shares is because when I shell the, sell the shares in my company, and typically you've held that those shares for more than a year, you get what's called long term capital gains. That means when I sell those my company shares, it's twenty percent federal tax. If I sell the assets. It's thirty six percent tax, so it's six. It's sixteen percent. Doesn't that depend on where you are? Nope. Nope. It's federally. It's a federal tax. It's anywhere in the United States. I mean, I guess if you're in another country, they have different tax rates. But in the U.S., a seller wants to sell their shares so they can ha enjoy a twenty percent tax rate. The buyer wants to buy the assets because they, for the reasons I just talked about. And so there's a natural tension between a buyer and a seller. The buyers want to do asset purchases. Sellers want to sell their shares to get that improved tax rate. And the, the, there's some ways to compromise in the middle, but that usually becomes a very important part of the negotiation. Well, there goes my plan to move to Florida. That wouldn't help me at all. <laughs> yeah, correct. <laughs> correct. It, Texas, right? We have, we, have, we have states that have no state income tax. But uh, what I'm talking about is just the federal rate, which is everywhere, no matter what state you're in. Right. Right? <laughs> so that, Every time I write my quarterly, my taxes to the... The California, the great sunshine state that we yep. pay for that sunshine. I write it to the federal. I cry a little, just a little bit. <laughs> just be glad you don't get all the government you pay for. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. <laughs> and my vote is, is incredibly unequal in California. <laughs> uh, okay, so when you're looking at, so we've talked about the seller. Now we want to talk about the buyer. There are different kinds of buyers. Yes. Typically, there's going to be, we, we lump buyers into two categories. One we call private equity, right? Mm -hmm. These are these are effectively banks or investment funds, if you will, who are buying your company for one thing only. They want that guaranteed, consistent return so they can put it in their portfolio. I want that. Can I have yeah. that? Right. So some of these funds, and the, you got everybody thinks, you know, there's a you know, when we have recessions or or when the economy is good or bad, everybody think thinks that. Uh, you know, it's, it'd be great to be a fund, but the problem is when you've got 20 or 30 or 40 or $100 billion sitting there and inflation is 4, 8, now 10%, right? Th they need a place for this money to go. There is so much money out there right now to buy companies. So the problem is they need to buy a profitable company. If you're not, if the company isn't kicking off a profit, you're just, chain, you're just trading dollars, right? They need to put their money somewhere where they can keep up with the inflation. The, 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 the most funds I know, are happy. These are, I'm talking private equity, right? These guys with billions and billions of dollars. They're like happy. you and I, obviously. Like we billions all have. And billions. They're happy to get a one or two percent return as long as they know it's going to last for years and years and years because they're just trying to not lose money getting eaten up by inflation, right? So private equity is all about your profitability. Now, what the other thing about a private equity buyer, like one of the large hedge funds in the world, one thing about the private equity buyers is that they also want a company that they don't have to come in and run and reinvent the wheel. They need to see that the company's there, has a track record, has a strong management team, you know, has a history of so that they can just effectively acquire the company, stick it in their portfolio, and then let it sit there and generate money. Uh, that, that's really important to the private equity that you have <clears throat> an excellent management team. And I'll talk about that a little later <clears throat> about some of the reasons deals fail. The other type of buyer is what we call strategic. So this is someone who buys you because it assists them in their current business. What's an example of a strategic buyer? Well, let's say you we had the example before about a car company that buys the tire company. They're buying someone in their supply chain, right? So now they're going to have let uh, hopefully uninterrupted uh, valuable commodity of the tires coming at at their direction. They're not the whims of of uh, having to go out and look for a vendor, right? So if you buy your vendors up, that's a strategic play. You may be buy a, co a competitor of yours so that you can combine the companies, right? <laughs> or you might buy uh, somebody who's in a related space where you have the same types of clients. For example, people who like flowers, for whatever reason, who buy flowers a lot, also tend to buy a lot of chocolate. So you might buy, have a flower company. No, you I might don't. go into the chocolate. Well, I'm just saying. I buy if, a normal amount of chocolate. Okay. <laughs> so so the, the strategic 
that that means the purchase isn't just because of the company's valuable, but the company you're buying has something that's going to enhance your company. Same clients, vendor, supplier, you know, maybe even your own customer base. Uh, you can you can you can uh, acquire people who are in your customer base, so you own effectively businesses that also vend to your clients. So you have that strategic buy, and you have the private equity. Those are the two things. The strategic buyers, though, be careful because they usually are going to buy your company and they don't really care about your management team that much. They're going to probably use their management team. They're going to probably fire a lot of the senior people and your trusted longtime employees. If there's any redundancy, right? They already have an accounting department. They already have an HR department. They might roll in a few of the rock stars, but when the strategic buyers buy, it's typically isn't a great thing for anybody who wants to stay and work in the company. That's right, because you said the private equity, they don't want to touch it. They just want something that's guaranteed money for them. Right. They want they want that they're not they don't want to come and rebuild it. Right. No. Obviously, no one to fire my stuff. They're amazing and excellent. But would I fire someone else if I acquired them? I don't need to be heads of HR. You're right. So right. think of it that way. Yeah. Uh, take some of the emotion out of it. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so you've gone through what the seller, the buyer. Um, how often do you think deals go through? If someone's sitting at the table and someone gives them what's what is it? Uh, a letter of intent? Yeah. Right. Um, at that point, they you know do their due diligence. They talk about all the things in the company that are going well. They talk about all the things in the company that are going wrong. That amount becomes different depending on what they find. If they are super excited, it could it could increase. Um, more often, I think it probably decreases a little bit because when they're looking at you know the things that are wrong with the car. Like right. you don't have seats. Okay, well, that's going to, you know, I'm not going to pay the full price for the car because it doesn't have the seats. Right. Um, but where where do you think that, what percentage of deals do you think make it? It gets just a guess in yeah, your experience. Yeah, I, I understand the question. The deals that make it through the letter of intent phase, most of them probably go through, not all of them, but most of them, if you can get through the letter of intent. And what's the letter of intent? The letter of intent, you know, it's a non-binding agreement, but what does it really do? Why do we have a letter of intent? What it really does is it provides a roadmap for the transaction, for the process. And the letter of intent should include all the material terms of a deal. All right, what's a material term? Price is always a material term, right? The material term. The material term. <laughs> the guy or gal who's selling the company, I'm going to want to non-compete from them. So that's a material term to me. I'm not going to do this deal if you're going to... I buy the company from you, <clears throat> the very next day you're going to go out and start a competing company, right? Nobody so would that would be that, ma that would be material of. to me. Sometimes it's material for many people to get certain key men and key women to make sure that when you buy the company, mm -hmm. they're going to come along with the acquisition. Because if they're not, the last thing I want to do is buy your company, have you sign a non-compete, and then have your top team and staff go start their own company and start competing with me, right? Didn't so think of that. Right. So so human it's all about people. So so uh having good transition of key employees is it would be a material term to me. It would be a material term to me to make sure if you have certain vendors and specialized pricing that after I close the sale, I'm still gonna be able to have that great relationship with that vendor and that specialized pricing. That might be a material term. Huh. It may be a material term that certain clients that I get to interview and in before I close the deal to make sure that these clients are going to be there afterwards and to really understand. So there's there there's an infinite potential amount of material terms that you could have. So what the letter of intent does, it lays out all those material terms. The second thing the letter of intent does, which is key, this it's to me it's almost the most best reason to do the letter of intent aside from all the the key material terms is it lay out what the process is going to be for the acquisition. Here's what's going to happen next. I'm going to do some due diligence. I'm going to want to see your accounting. I'm going to want to talk to your key people. I want to talk to your some of your top clients. Um, I need to do some market research, whatever it may be, for me to do my due, what we call due diligence, to make sure that you're what you're selling me really exists to make sure you really own the company you say you own to make sure you really own the intellectual property that you say that you own in the company. I want to check all that out so that when I buy either the assets or the shares, I'm getting what I think I'm getting and what you think you're, you're, you're selling me. So that, that having that uh, due diligence process explained to the letter of intent is super important. And then it'll also explain then the letter of intent, the process of what will happen uh, in terms of how we'll wrap the deal up, how you'll be paid, when you'll be paid. Um, the Especially by sellers who have never done it before, they spook easy. 
And if you call them up and ask them for something that they weren't expecting, like, wait, what do you mean you need to see my past three years tax returns? What do you mean you need to see all my bank statements? What, I didn't, what are you, what are you talking about? I, you think I'm a liar? What's the problem here? These are normal so, questions that I asked you. It's but, fine. But you would think they would be normal. <laughs> <clears throat> so if you don't surprise your seller, if there's no surprises, because they've seen this letter of intent, they see all the material terms that you're looking for, the process is well described, what's going to happen to them. That way, when it happens to them, they expect it to happen and they're in a good mood versus like, Hold on a minute. I need to talk to my lawyer about it. and and you can deals. We try to get a deal done from letter of intent to closing in in forty five days if we can. Because one thing on both sides, seller and buyer side, deals get stinky like fish if you leave them out on the counter too long. You know they start thinking, man, maybe I should be selling for more. Man, do I really want to sell? You know maybe what I could buy happen? For less. Maybe I don't. <laughs> right. And so maybe and so uh, you want to have this process laid out showing how you're going to go from soup to nuts from beginning to end in 45 days or less and make sure that that seller saw that letter of intent that's a roadmap that to getting to the end of this and they bought on because it is like a roadmap because um, if you don't know where you're going, you will definitely get there. That's your favorite thing to say. <laughs> it is. One of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, material terms are so very important. I don't understand a lot of them when we went through, um, we've been to the selling table a couple times. One, we thought we were going to sell back when um, Andy started not feeling well and started getting ill. Um, so he's like, hey, let's just let's just sell so I can make sure the family has this guaranteed income. Right. And I was on board until we've been through it a couple times. Because like you said, that 45-day mark, man, um, we're starting to renegotiate our own process on selling as a business owner are you even ready to sell your business it's an emotional thing it is if emotional. you've done it it's your baby um you are not going to be excited to sell it unless the number blows you away if it doesn't if right. it seems reasonable which i think probably a lot of them are reasonable um then you start to question it after 45 days so what happened yep. to me is they said hey we'd like to continue due diligence it's been 45 days we're going to give you another letter of intent i said no thank you yeah i am now uninterested in selling to you the process has been exhausting and and, and expensive yep that's um, right. And that's the, that, yeah. that really is what – I'm glad you said that. That's one of the most important parts of the letter of intent that I forgot, which is if you do a good job on that letter of intent with all those material terms and what the process is, if the seller doesn't have the stomach for it, they won't sign that letter of intent, which it's sad mm -hmm. you didn't do the deal, but it's sadder to sign the – to do a poorly written letter of intent, spend twenty, forty, dollars $100,000 with your attorney only to find out right before closing – there's something that, that they can't live with. Oh, you want to non-compete? You never brought that up before. I'm not doing the deal. You just build how much with the attorneys to find that out. You should find that out on day one. Well, I I only know because I've done it myself and actually have gone to um, stages and spoke on it because I thought, I don't know about these things. And as a business owner, I wish somebody would have told me. Like, I didn't think to, to ask you ahead of time. We went to the, hey, we want to sell our company. You're like, great, here's how it goes. But we didn't think about the the incredible expense of yep. the the due diligence of its software. It's much much higher because you have to have a data room where they're looking at your code. They bring specialists, right? Um, especially if you're selling for you know upwards <clears throat> of you know tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, they're going to do a really great deal with due diligence to make sure they're getting the right thing. And but what what happened with me was we saw that it took our entire top staff away from growing the company. So I've wasted, if, because we did not end up selling, we've wasted over a month of trying to get together everything of why we're awesome right. for the potential seller. And fun fun thing was uh, they still wanted to buy me. And I was the one that said, nah, I'm good. I actually, I really like my company. I'd like to keep it. Yeah. I wasn't quite ready to sell. Um, it wasn't even the number. I was like, I'm just not ready. I think we're going to grow and I'm not done growing it. And our staff is excited and look at our numbers. Why wouldn't you want to buy us? Of course you would. Yeah. Well, so, that, that's a perfect example of why you want to find out early if the deal is going to work versus later because you, you waste an incredible amount of human and resources and money. Well, think of your top staff. What do you pay them? If they're being paid you know, 100000 or more a year and you've got six or seven of your top C-suite or your top management team working on this due diligence, they are not managing their team as effectively and they're not yeah. growing or being creative right. about growing your company. Um you did say something earlier that I thought was interesting when you were talking about the non-competes, which I never thought about until it was brought to my attention in the material terms. That non-compete for me as a business owner, I understand, hey, I own a software. And so if you buy it, you don't want me to go next week and, and take all the, the knowledge I have and, and create the competitor for you. You've just bought it. I should be quiet and, and go retire or do something else that's not 
the software. Um, but you also mentioned your the upper staff, all the like the C-suites and the upper managers. Yep. And that actually brings me to a good point when you're talking about the LLC and the voting rights and the company stocks and stuff. That's one reason to give equity to your upper staff. So they will sign that non-compete and they're excited about <clears throat> the deal. That's exactly right. And people don't appreciate the fact that non-competes in every form, in every state, and most countries are not enforceable except for one exception. And that exception is when you sell a company, you can be asked to sign a non-compete. But otherwise, you can't make your employees sign non-competes. But if your employees are owners, right, if they're owners, then they can be, and in your operating agreement, you build in that, hey, if for any reason you ever sell your stock, you're going to agree not to compete for a few years, and that's built in. They're, that's going to be enforceable against them. So it's giving equity to employees, while you know giving equity is not everybody's favorite thing to do, but it, nowadays in the marketplace, you have to do it to get certain talent. And one of the benefits is then you can wrap them up in a non-compete. Well, if you're going to the due diligence thing, you said they want to talk <clears> to your key staff. So if it's buying your company, if it's a strategic buyer, they um, – aren't necessarily going to keep the upper staff, but if it's a private equity, they do want to keep that upper staff. So right. you want your upper staff to actually be excited that you're selling. So they're going to help the deal, not yeah. crush the deal, not make it take longer, not be a grumpy pants. We don't want yeah. that. So having them have an ownership stake too, gives them that incentive to help sell the company. That's and right. Be happy about it. That's right. Which we all want. Um, so when deals do fail, because a lot of times they do fail, what are some of the reasons that deals don't work out. Sure. <clears throat> so there's there's a whole panoply of reasons that are out there, a virtual cornucopia of them. But uh, the <laughs> but maybe some of the most common ones, common reasons that uh, they fail is you get into the due diligence, and even the sellers have been believing their own press, and you then you dive into their books or their company records, and they find out that the company isn't as profitable as they say it is. Right, and so that affects the value. And if the value gets affected too much, sellers aren't going to want to sell. The, one of the more common things, especially in today's world of intellectual property, which we call IP, right, uh, is that the company won't own its own IP, and they think it does because, of course, we own it because we have it. Well, a, a classic example is a software company that's had a number of developers work on their code over the years, and if you're an employee, you're Company is deemed to own your work. That's great. But if your brother-in-law worked on some of the code and then gets divorced from your sister and she hates you, uh, if for whatever the reason is, if or, or people die or disappear, uh, so and, you, and, they're, and they're not employees, <laughs> well, then what happens? Their code is their code. Even though it's you're using it, it's in your company, it never goes away. You don't get it. It's not a gift. And so if you can't demonstrate that you own all your intellectual property. That means in the case of a software company, your code. In the case of a, a sales coaching company, let's say you have a nice big coaching company and a lot of your clients are coaches yep. and they have a lot of materials, right? And those materials are going to be subject to copyright, right? If it's a picture or a literary work or a recording, it's going to be copyright. <clears throat> well, who took those pictures? Who wrote that song? Who wrote that, who wrote that copy? Because if it's not your employees or you, then you have independent contractors doing it or third parties doing it. And we have to run around. It's very common in deals that when we're trying to sell the company, the buyers comes along and asks for proof that they own you own all your intellectual property. Well, we're chasing now people who used to work at the company 10, 15, 20 years ago to get them to assign us whatever it might be, the copy or the code or the pictures. And of course, what do these people do when you come to them and they, they put their hand out? So yeah, yeah, I'll sign it for a piece of the deal, right? So you really want to be what we call exit ready. And exit ready means before you sell, it's really a good idea to come see somebody like me or somebody who knows how to sell companies. And we'll go through and do all the due diligence that the buyer's about to do to you. And when we run across the freckles, and there's always a freckle, right? Or a problem, or, a, mm -hmm. or uh, then we can fix those. We can get out ahead of those things so that when the buyers do come along, <clears throat> everything's already nicely packaged. Hey, look, our ownership's all square. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, uh, how many cases there are, lawsuits there are, where somebody will sell a company and then somebody comes out of the woodwork and says, hey, wait a minute. You told me when the company sold, I was getting 20% of this. No, I didn't. Yes, I did. No, I didn't. Yes, I did. Well, you think the buyer wants that headache? They buy a company and they're in a lawsuit over who owns their company? Right after that, they don't. So ownership of the company, ownership of the IP, those are two huge 
So first things we look at uh, when we when we uh, are doing diligence on the company. The next problem uh, that companies face and is a challenge to sales all the time is they don't have their HR in order. Right, we come in and we look at what they've, how they've run their company, how they've dealt with their employees, and we realize they've got half their company are independent contractors. When I know their employees, or half the company isn't being taking their breaks, or half the company isn't, you know, doing some other thing that would be a violation of the labor code. Well, out here in California, we have PAGA, P A G A, Private Attorney General Act. If you sue your employer because they didn't give you enough break time. You're allowed now in California as that plaintiff to have your lawyer audit the entire business for all of their employment practices. So now this one tiny little break time case is now a, basically a class action against everybody in your company covering all of your employees. And these guys come in, these plaintiff's lawyers, and they audit each. They want to see their pay stubs to make sure the pay stubs have the right form. They have a checklist, right? And they'll always find something. And it becomes the full employment act for the plaintiff's attorney. So it, having your uh, your HR department locked down and tight and make and having good uh, employment practices is a, another thing that will cause a business to fail because nobody's going to buy a business for 10 or $15 million, I'm just going to say, if there's 5 or $10 million of liability on it, right? Oh, that's weird. It, yeah. it happens. It happens. The math doesn't work out. <laughs> all the time. Another common, there's two other things I want to touch on that are common things that might mm -hmm. be relevant to the people who watch it. Another common reason a deal will fail, especially in the strategics, <clears throat> is that they'll have an emotional attachment to the company and a feeling of loyalty to their staff. We literally were doing a deal about two years ago, just over twenty million dollars. It was a it was a accounting software company out of Fontana of all places, and uh, who would know that Fontana had that kind of company? But anyway. Uh, we were probably two weeks from closing the deal and the seller called up one time when it became clear to him that my client was going to fire everyone there because it was a roll up or another accounting firm by another yep. company. He says, I'm playing golf with a guy who worked for me for 20 years and he was saying how happy he was to be working at the company. His kids are in college and how his life is going good. And I knew that this is my client talking that mm -hmm. this guy wasn't going to have a job in a month. And I don't know how he was going to put his kids in college. And he says, I can't do that. These people are my friend. I can't sell. It was a really sweet story. But there, this is why we like to get deals done in 45 days if we can, because people start thinking and having those types of uh, seller remorse. It's a, it's a real problem. Finally, and especially this is the private equity one, the management team. If your management team is made up of, you know, Cousin Eddie and you know, a bunch of yuckles that you've you've cobbled together. They may be doing great. It may have brought the company to where it is. But if private equity wants, they want to come in and see a professionalized management team so they can fire and forget, right? They put them in their portfolio and then don't have to really supervise them again. And I have literally, I, I'll never forget, it was a health food supplement company. We were going to sell it for $22 million. They flew in from New York on their Learjet or whatever their big private jet was. We picked them up. We came in because you always you always interview the management team, right, if you're private equity before you finalize the sale. That's part of your diligence. Huh? So we passed all the initial diligence. They came to do the meet the management team. Usually it's a day-long meeting. The guys were there an hour, and they went and got in their jet and flew home and sent us a nice – and told us on the way out the door, I, I can't take – I can't tell this to my board. The, these people may be doing great, but they're not professionalized enough, right? They're sitting in the meetings, you know, with their chew and spitting in the cups and – just, not, just not, not having the presence. It was a horrible, and we try to, we try to put all the lipstick we can on the pigs to make to clean up the management teams. But one of the things we'll do if a client comes to me and says I'm ready to sell is I'll go as part of our diligence. We'll look at their management team and I'll say, look, we need to go hire some people who can sit at the table and talk to private equity to, with the private equity firms and give them the confidence. Because if you don't have a real live strong management team, a professionalized management team, you won't get private equity. They 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 just can't. Oh, my my so, um, my pastor used to make jokes about the the summer dresses. He's like, girls, summer dresses look amazing. Keep those at home, not in the church. And he goes, but you know, if the barn needs painting, and I was like, oh, oh no, <laughs> wear makeup, look pretty, like yeah. go to church, dress respectfully, or whatever. I think that's really funny. Um, so I'm not worried at all. I'm definitely not stressed. But um, asking for a friend, how would you make sure that you own the IP code? You well. 
<laughs> the best way is probably have your lawyer look at it for you, right? Because it's 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 it, IP ownership is a difficult thing. But there's two ways. There's in what we call invention assignments, and we have all of our employees and all of my clients' companies. Even though as an employee, I get your intellectual property, we also get a, an assignment from them. Mm -hmm. And those assignments, are, especially with the dev groups and the and the marketing people who create content or or code. Um, it, it doesn't matter so much for your salespeople. It doesn't matter so much for your human resources to have those sorts of things. But your code. But anything, who, anybody who's creating any type of content for you, any kind of intellectual property, you both you a they're an employee. That's your first line of defense. Second, those assignments are good. And then third, anybody who's an independent contractor, you make sure in those independent contractor agreements that there's an assignment in those agreements, so that for the money they're getting, they're assigning to you all the work that they're creating. Those are those are really the best ways to proactively protect your uh, intellectual property. We obviously already have that. So yes. we don't have to talk about yep. it later. You can build me. No. You do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't cry when I write your checks. I do cry when I write the tax checks, but just wildly different amounts. Um, okay. So I think we've covered um, a lot of what you do or what you would suggest other business owners do or think about when they're going through an m a a mergers and acquisitions or a, a selling or buying of a company um is there anything else you think would be important to touch on that we've maybe missed yeah i think maybe the only other thing that a business really wants to watch for is where and how they're being taxed their business right um th as we talked about earlier some states or seven of them don't have a state income tax so if you're able to locate your business in a state without state income tax you're going to avoid that tax. So California here, it's a 13.5% tax, right? A state income tax. So if we can move your company out of the state, it really works great with internet companies to be able to do that. Publishing companies, all kinds. That, that is a huge uh, advantage. I mean, people kill themselves to get two, three, four more percent profitability in a year. Just by moving out of California, you can get 13.5% more profitability if you can do it. Well, Tesla's in Nevada. They right. just have to move a whole factory. That's that, that's right. And what's what what people don't really appreciate is you can have your business in California, but it can be owned by your Nevada company, right? And or whatever whatever state might not have that state income tax. And so that's a way to you know you can't avoid all the taxes in California when you're here. You're going to have to pay for the sales you have here, no matter what. You're going to have a sales tax. Um, you're going to have employees here. You're going to have those withholdings that are for the, for them. But at the same time. That parent company can charge its subsidiary for the IP that it's licensing to its subsidiary, right? And we're going to license the IP to the California company, and we're going to charge as much as we legally, legally possibly can do that. Why is that? That creates a deduction for the California company. That means there's less profit in California. That means there's less tax in California. And that those payments for that IP license that go to the parent company, where are they realized? Over in Nevada or some other state where there's no state income tax, right? So right there, there's a very simple way to avoid taxes and you can still have your business in California and have its headquarters not in California. Legal strategies are amazing. I uh, access as many as I can yeah. and your law firm tells me when I can't do something when I can and I listen every time. But wait, there's more. <laughs> no. Not only, yeah, it's true. Does it come with not, spatulas? Yeah, it does. <laughs> not only can we put your company in a state without the state income tax, but then we have a choice of what type of taxing you're going to have. There's only two types of taxes that exist out there, right? Mm -hmm. There's a corporate tax at 21% for what we call C corporations or LLCs that make a C election. Same thing, no difference. Or there's the ordinary tax rate. The C corporation is taxed at 21%. Thank you, Donald Trump, right? Otherwise, ordinary taxes are up to 36% federal. So if you can have a cal business in California if you don't have the C election, it's 36% federal tax to you, plus the 13.5% state tax, effectively 50% tax, right? That same business, if we move it to a Nevada or a state without a state income tax, and we make the C election to have a C corporation at the top of it to go to 21%, you just moved your tax rate from 50% to 21%. You just saved 29% on every dollar of taxes you pay. And well, so I have that now. You have that now, but now everybody else <laughs> who's listening to this, thing. well, it, it, it does. It makes sense to have a C corporation once you're making more money than you need. If you if all the money comes in, you have to distribute out right away. It doesn't really give you an advantage to, to having the C-Corp. But if you have a profitable business, 
you were going to have a C corporation. There isn't one major business that I know of. There's no business that makes any real profit that isn't at the top a C corporation. There isn't. There aren't any. Because one other little have- tiny thing I know um, is that if you have foreign investors or if, if people from Canada, Europe, wherever it may be, oh, no. they only, only, only want to invest in or own parts of C corps. Because if they own anything that isn't a C corporation or an LLC with the C election, then they create U.S. tax event for them, and they're gonna have to pay taxes at home and in the U.S. So, so the last thing I wanted to share with you here today is not only these other things we've talked about, but take stock in, or maybe that's not a good way to say it, be mindful of the type of entity you have and where you're located. It can save you up to 29% on their taxes. It's crazy. Do you know what's really boring? <laughs> Lawyers talking about taxes? <laughs> Tax percentages, but you know what's really fun? With the money you saved, going and buying things like boats. <laughs> that's right. Well, you know what Warren Buffett said the eighth wonder of the world is? Compounded interest, right? And this is... Right, he thinks it's the eighth wonder of the world, but this is really that, isn't it? Because you're now paying maybe 29% less in taxes, or even if you just avoid the state taxes, 10%. Well, that year after year after year, that money that gets reinvested in your business and other capital assets, yep. it's it's having that uh, that compounding effect, and you know we can all be like Warren Buffett. So, last two questions: um, What are the states that you do not want to own a company in, and what are the states you? Do just off the top of your head, just a couple. Sure. Absolute no nos. Ab- absolute no nos are California and New York. And it's because the state taxes are so darn high and it's because the regulations are so high. We call California the left coast. The employment laws, we talked about that PAGA lawsuit. Huh? It's just it's just ravaging em- employers. It's it's impossible to be perfect. And you have 100, 200, 300 employees here in California. Inevitably, there's going to be a challenge there on one of them. So the amount of regulations that we have here in California on all levels, plus the highest tax rate, I'm if I'm surprised anybody does business here. And New York's the same way nowadays. Anything along the coast, uh, you know, this isn't meant to be political, but basically the Democratic states are lousy to do business in, and the Republican states tend to be more business friendly, right? So we love Nevada's. We love Texas. Those are the states we like. Florida, we love those states because they uh, are more business friendly. Wyoming's an awesome one. But Texas does have a caveat. You've got when it hits a certain amount, it's not no. Yeah, it, it becomes there's one percent after five hundred thousand or some. So there's some amount of tax, but compared to California, it's, it's a walk in the park. <laughs> oh no, I signed that on tax bill to Texas State, and I just like yeah. laugh my way to the bank. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> um, and then. Very last question before I thank you for your time and all of this incredibly valuable information for a business owner. Um, what are you going to do with the rest of your week? What am I going to do with the rest of my week? So what is today? Thursday? Don't say solve my issues. Mine are all solved already. Yeah, time. yeah, yeah. I think I think that really my next big plan is to see who's going to win this Super Bowl here between Kansas City and uh, Philadelphia. I'm kind of leaning towards – I like Mahomes, so I'm hoping Kansas City wins it. So. Yeah, my son's a Mahomie, so he, if I vote for somebody else or – I say vote, but everyone else says root, um, <laughs> then he gets mad at me. So, so I'm definitely going to root vote for Mahomie. All right, great. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, thanks for your time, man. I just have to tell you about Katra, the marketing platform that has seriously transformed my business. You know how running a business can be insanely time consuming, right? Well, Katra has been a game changer for me. It's honestly like having an entire marketing team in my pocket. And what I love most is that it automates all the tedious daily tasks for me, from marketing to sales to even customer experience. I can't believe how much time and energy I've saved since I started using it. And get this. With Kartra, I can create websites, funnels, courses, membership sites, email campaigns, calendars, surveys, you name it. It's made managing my business so much simpler and more affordable. Honestly, I can't recommend Kartra enough. If you're curious, head to paidcreatepodcast.com backslash Kartra to start your trial. Trust me, you won't regret it.